one of my favorite TV shows is Fast and Loud. And <clears throat> yeah, I know I'm not very discriminating because this is a terrible show, but I don't watch it because of the characters. They're not very appealing to me. They don't reflect my lifestyle and my beliefs. They're much about what I think. And I really don't watch it because of the storylines because they're virtually the same story every week. Go out and find a car, set a deadline to fix the car, have a thousand little things go wrong to make you think they'll never meet the, meet the deadline, get in a fight about the deadline, meet the deadline. That's the storyline every week. But they do one thing that I love to see. They restore old cars. They'll drive some old clunker onto the lot and they'll get ready to restore it and as soon as I see it I am transported back to the good old days I mean I think boy I've seen a car just like that I remember the guy who drove that car I remember what that looked like in the lot when we used to go by and drool over it and, and smell the the insides and I remember the burning rubber whenever we'd have drag races and I can remember looking in the old car magazines Wow, I wish I could get a hold of one of those old cars. I'd give anything. I told my wife the other day, there was a fellow on Velocity Channel who was rebuilding uh, some old car, and I said, I always wanted it. It was a Dodge Charger, a 70 Dodge Charger. I always wanted that car. I had one in my hands, and my dad wouldn't let me buy it. She said, what would it cost to get one now? Being very generous, and I said, oh, around $325,000. <laughs> Watching that show stirs up all sorts of memories in me. Just the good old days of cars, when cars are really cars. You could work on them, you could rebuild them, you could soup them up, you could do all kinds of things to them. Just the good old days. Now, the past really grabs us, doesn't it? Uh, it? It grabs all of us. People we've known, places that we've seen, songs that we've heard. I, I could probably just mention something like uh, the Moody Blues, In Search of the Lost Chord. And a lot of you in the audience would say, oh, I remember where I was when I heard, and we've got that, that name of that song down. They always seem to be the good old days. We were younger, we were stronger, we worked harder and for less. We were more moral, we were more idealistic, we were wiser. You got this thing, they sure don't make them like they used to. Nostalgia is big business. Nostalgia is fun. I, television shows, you know, American Pickers and American Restoration and on and on and on, shows about antiques and shows about restoring old cars. And entire radio stations and television channels are dedicated to the oldies, playing all of those old shows, old songs, old radio programs that we used to listen to. And there were some really good, old, good things about the good old days. Unfortunately... The past can grab us and hold us so tightly in some bad ways that when we get, we, we get into the present, we lock down in the present and we can't meet the challenges of right now because we're pining for the good old days. And so God says to Israel in Isaiah chapter 43, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. They have gotten discouraged. They've fallen into hopelessness. All, all the great acts of God seem to be in the past. Here we are, they say, mired in exile, stuck in Babylon, and we're just, and we are, we're just stuck. There's not anything we can do, no place we can go, we can't look for anything. All they could do was just kind of look lovingly and longingly over their shoulders at things gone by to remember home and to remember the Holy Land and remember the days of Moses and Joshua to remember the golden age of David and just just sigh we wish it could be like that once again and you understand they had a past to forget they had a negative past they had a personal past that needed to be left behind you, you read through Isaiah and you read about idolatry and about immorality and about greed and violence and and oppression it, it seems that there is almost nothing that God does not accuse Judah of and their situation in exile seems to say to them that God will never forgive. They're just going to be punished forever. God has, has, has refused to forgive. God has put them here, and he's going to leave them here. You and I know that we have a past that we need to forget. 
shameful things that embarrass us when we think about how foolish we were, painful things that prick our hearts and, and make us bleed in sorrow. And we read the New Testament sometimes about unpardonable sins, and we wonder, oh, is that me? You know, have I ever done that? Is that, is that really what, what, what Jesus is talking about? But listen, praise God, because God, in His mercy, in His grace and mercy, He has given us a way to forget the past to forget our sinful past, one of those new things that God is powerful enough to bring about, he's determined enough and loving enough to accomplish in our own lives, he provides his son as a way of, of wiping away our sin. And, and even more than that, incredibly, of reshaping our past so that uh, it, it seems as though it never happened. The writer of Hebrews will say, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. As God promises a time when he is not going to hold those things against us and not going to let them shape our lives, we can forget them and we can leave them behind. And so God says, forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. I'm doing a new thing. You know, Judah has some negative experiences that they need to forget too, don't they? I, they've gone through the horrors of war. They have gone through the horrors of loneliness and abandonment. They have suffered terribly. Their minds have been scarred. It would be so easy to fall into despair and just never amount to anything again. I, why try? My, my life has been ruined. There is no, no hope. There is no future. Some of us have some pain that we have to forget too. Benjamin Reeves, an African-American preacher to whom I'm indebted for a lot of these thoughts about this passage in Isaiah. Benjamin Reeves speaks of people who still live in haunted houses, houses haunted by the ghosts of painful memories, memories that barely cover wounds that have never healed. Oh, he says if they have healed, they've covered, they're covered with the painful growth of scar tissue. And some of us have grown up with terrible abuse. Some of us have suffered terrible losses of, of children or of others who are so very special to us. Some of us have suffered public embarrassment and humiliation. Others have experienced betrayal and abandonment and loneliness. And, and it's not as though we're supposed to forget the people that we love or even to forget the experiences that we have, but, but we have to turn loose of the pain and turn loose of the resentment so that it doesn't control us and lead us deeper into despair and bitterness and hatred. And we need to take hold of the new life that God offers us in the spirit of Jesus. And again, praise God, he's made that possible too. I read in Revelation 21, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among, his, among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who, has seated on his, who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And it isn't as though God is saying this to people who've had it pretty easy. You know, they've been prosperous and they've kind of messed around through life and, and God promises them some good things because they've been pretty good people overall. But he is writing to people who've seen loved ones murdered because of uh, the fact that they are Christian. And they have seen children starve because their dads can't get jobs because their dads are Christians. And it's almost as though you could just pick up the book of Revelation and just wring the blood out of it and listen to the scream of anguish from those desolated sufferers. And God says, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. But even that, those two things, the forgetting the negative past of sin, forgetting the negative past of, of suffering, even those two things are really not what God is talking about here in this passage. If you back up to verse 16, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick, forget the former things. He isn't wanting them, or he isn't directing them right here so much to forget negative things as much as God is wanting them to forget positive things, things 
those, those, those great acts of God when he intervened on Israel's behalf and did these huge miracles and accomplished great things. God says, remember me? I am the one who parted the Red Sea and everybody walked across on dry land. Forget that. The emphasis on this passage is not that Israel should refuse to be prisoners of a negative past, but that Israel cannot be prisoners of a positive past either. God had performed great miracles for Israel, but the problem is now they're living on past blessings. They were kind of locked in the prison of the past. They were locked into a faith that only looked backward to what God had done once in the past, and they'd stopped looking forward to what God could do and would do. They had a faith that stopped expecting anything from God. They were, they were locked in memory, and they were locked up by their memory. I don't think it's too much to suggest that, that we might be no different. Living in the glow of past blessing, subsisting on the crumbs of spiritual nostalgia. When we talk about the power of God in our own lives, we're always looking back to that day. We look back to the time, back to those events and those blessings that are a part of a positive past that has essentially made us prisoners. We live through past glories. But we refuse to believe that God can do anything with us right now. In, in many marriages, the only hope that there is, the only spark that's left is this life of memory. Looking back to the early days of courtship, looking back to the early days of marriage, and husband and wife sitting night after night in front of a television screen where actors simulate more love and passion than those two people ever experience in their marriage. And they look back and they think, oh, we wish it could be like that again. Oh, Oh, we remember the good. We remember what it used to be like. And they wish and they remember, but they don't ever do anything about it. And they are just trapped and they're ruined by a positive past. In our own spiritual lives, the measure of our expectation is what it used to be. We look back to the time when we eagerly got up early and read the Bible and we prayed and the Word of God touched us and it molded us and it affected our hearts. And our enthusiasm was just ablaze, and we were on fire, and we had a commitment to purity and honesty that was deep and strong. And we say, oh, man, those were the good old days. God will not let you settle for being a prisoner of the past, either negative or positive. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And this word is calling us to a faith that will not be limited by the past. It's calling us to live expectantly. Verse 19 says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And God is calling us from remembering to expecting. God is calling us not to forget past blessing, that's not the point. Forget about all that, just though it never happened. But the point is that God's blessings are new. Build on that past. If God did that in the past, imagine what he's capable of in the future. Imagine what he can do with you now. God's new thing is going to transcend the past. If you think that was great, he says, you just wait till you see this. You ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to be greater than the Exodus. It's going to be greater than the Red Sea. It's going to be greater than the days of the conquest. It's going to be greater than the golden days of David. And God calls us from simply remembering to expecting based upon these memories. I don't forget the past, but I look for a future that will transcend the past. Benjamin Reeves says, living expectantly is faith on tiptoe. You know how it is when you want to look into the in, in, at the, in the bakery window, you know, and they've got all those cakes and all that good stuff there. Even though you're tall enough and you can see, you know, there's nothing in your way, you catch yourself getting up on tiptoe to be able to see better because that's just kind of the way it is. And that's the way it is with, with faith, or at least it ought to be with faith. Living expectantly means believing with God that life is worthwhile. Believing that ministry, he's, Benjamin Reeves says, believing that ministry will never become routine for me. Believing that in God I will never experience the dullness of the daily. I live in the expectancy that in my life God will do a new thing that will transcend the past. I remember the old commercials. A woman walks into the laundromat 
and a man meets her there. I always wonder why the women always walked in the laundromat and were never surprised that there were a million TV cameras sitting there looking at them. But anyway, she walks into the laundromat and the man immediately reaches to, for her detergent in the top of her basket and says, may I have that? And she says, oh no, don't take my Tide. And he responds, but I have something better than Tide. And she says, can there be anything better than Tide? And he pulls the cover off, his, off the box and what have you got? New Tide. Same old, but it smells better. Same old, but it has a different color. Same old, but it has a new label. I even found on YouTube a video advertising a new kind of Tide. It was called, it said, now with new car scent. And I couldn't decide if that was a sarcasm or if that was really something Tide had developed because I couldn't go, what, what, why would you want new car sin on your clothes? But maybe that goes with watching fast and loud. I don't know. But nevertheless, it's just that same old, same old with just a new label, with just a little bit different packaging, with just a little bit different chemical added to make it seem a little bit different. And God says, I am doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it, he says? So both Isaiah and John in the book of Revelation talk about people singing new songs. We're not singing the same old nostalgic songs, remembering how it used to be. We've got a whole new way of singing because life has been transformed and life has been changed and great new things are happening. Behold, all things are new. There is a new heaven and a new earth. And he isn't talking about new and improved in the sense of, let's just add a little bit of change to this and see if we can sell a little bit more. But he is talking about being completely remade and reborn and renewed. We were, Paul says, therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Jesus says no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. And then Paul will say, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. The scripture describes this new thing as, as unprecedented, as unexpected. In Isaiah, as God announces this new thing, he says, I'm going to make a highway in the desert. I'm going to cause water to flow in a desert wasteland. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And if you think back, I mean, if we're going to go back and remember some things, God has a track record with the desert, doesn't he? As he led his people across the desert, it was there that he provided for them water to drink, and he provided manna for them, and even their clothes didn't wear out. I mean, he gave them what they needed. What is it that God is doing for you today? There are new things in store for you every day because God is doing a new thing, and it will satisfy every need that you have in our marriages God is doing a new thing in our homes God is doing a new thing in our churches God is doing a new thing in our spiritual lives God is doing a new thing our best days aren't past they are right here in the present and they lie before us in the future because God is able and he will do it I call on you to shake the past and to leave it behind and to embrace new things to accept the forgiveness that Christ brings and to be free of the mistakes and rebellions of the past. I call on you to receive the Holy Spirit and his power, to, to, his power to renew you, his power to recreate you, to bring you new days and new songs and a brand new you. To, I, I call on you to establish your faith, to root your faith in Jesus and his Father, and to know that we don't serve a dead God of the past. We serve the living and true God who is not remote and powerless, but who is working to build highways in the deserts and who calls things into existence that do not right now exist. I call on you to declare your faith, to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Jesus, 
And if you haven't been baptized, what Peter says is the forgiveness is for the forgiveness of sins and also for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul will call it in Titus 3, 5, the washing of renewal and rebirth through the Holy Spirit. Or I'm sorry, the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Get yourself baptized and get God's new you. Would you come while we're singing? Let's stand, please.